Welcome to Second Recapped. The movie begins in 1942. The United States Navy is preparing to attack Japan in retaliation for what transpired on December 7, 1941, by sending torpedo bombers and fighter planes across the South Pacific. On the 16th of January, pilot and Chief Harold Dixon, Bombardier Tony Pastula, and radio man Gene Aldrich are on a patrol mission when they become separated from the other aircraft and unable to recover their bearings. Dixon believes they should return to their carrier, but Gene realizes they have no reception and are running out of fuel. Tony drops the bombs in the sea to gain height, but it's not much help, and because they still can't get communications working, Dixon decides to make an emergency landing before they run out of fuel and crash. The jet safely crashes on the sea and Dixon emerges wearing a life jacket and pulling the life raft behind him, but his soldiers aren't faring so well. They're having problems getting out of their seats and nearly drowning, barely escaping at the last second, which means they won't be able to collect supplies before the plane sinks. Dixon and Gene surrender their guns as well, making it simpler for them to float, but Tony is trapped with his. After some struggle, they manage to inflate the raft, although it's upside down. By tying their life jackets together and throwing them over the raft, they create a handle that allows them to pull and turn the raft over so they can finally climb on it. Now they just have to wait to be found. The next morning, Dixon and Gene exchange a few words over what happened, each man indirectly implying the other may have done something wrong. Seeing as such conversation takes them nowhere, they decide to take watch and stay alert in case a plane comes by. Turns out they're in luck and a plane does fly nearby a few hours later but it doesn't come close enough to see them, even when they take off their shirts and wave them around as they yell. The plane leaves soon, and Dixon explains this was their only chance. The plane was on a box search and won't break course that could risk them into enemy territory. The war is more important than three soldiers. Procedure says one quick look is all they get. Thinking of their survival, Dixon declares the raft to be a ship of the USA Navy and him her captain, so Tony and Jean will be following his orders. They take inventory of the things they have in their pockets, but it's not much, mostly a bunch of tools and random things like wires, plus an empty water bag. Jean also has a knife that Dixon orders to be kept in his pocket to avoid the risk of cutting the raft, to protect the raft and avoid wearing it off. Dixon also orders them to take off their shoes and throw them in the ocean, but he doesn't throw his own, which irritates Jean. The hours and the days begin passing as the soldiers try their best not to let the isolation drive them crazy. They chat about various topics, sometimes even sing to keep themselves entertained. Tony obsessively cleans his gun, but also promises Jean he'll introduce him to his sister since they make a wonderful couple. The sun is scorching during the day so they little by little lose each layer of clothing, gaining blisters on their skin. The nights are cold, and when they sleep, they're haunted by nightmares involving drowning or the guilt of the possible mistake that got them in this situation in the first place. The three of them don't sleep at the same time though, one always stays awake, and they take turns to watch in case they find a plane or an island. It's during one of these watches that Dixon decides to relieve himself in his own shoe and drink his own pee to at least try to satiate his thirst a little. One morning, when they feel a nice breeze moving the boat along, Dixon makes some calculations to have a vague idea of where they are heading. There's a chance they'll reach some islands, but it'll be weeks before that happens, so Gene decides he wants to try fishing to avoid starving to death. With some wire and cord, they make a hook that they throw into the sea, but whatever bites is strong. Tony has to help Gene pull back, and when they finally recover the end of the line, the hook is gone, reminding them there are some dangerous creatures out there. But Gene doesn't give up, he just makes a new hook and throws it again, leaving it in the water as long as necessary. Eventually though, the heat gets on his nerves, so he puts on the life jacket and jumps off the boat to freshen up. Tony wants to go after him, but Dixon says they should do it one at a time for safety. He also reminds them there are sharks in these waters which scares Jean into swimming back onto the raft and Tony into refusing to jump in next after all. As days continue to pass, tension grows among the men, and Dixon's paranoia makes him keep on asking his men what happened on the plane, as if trying to find someone to blame for their situation. Thirst is also starting to be a problem, and Tony thinks he could perhaps have at least a sip of seawater, but Dixon stops him before he does something stupid. Gene comments on how many more shoes they may fill with the yellow stuff when he's suddenly interrupted by Dixon crying out in triumph. He's found a pencil in his pocket that he had overlooked before. Now he can draw a chart and keep an eye on the direction they're heading. If they want to reach the island, they need to keep the wind in their favor. Using one of the life jackets, some cord, and some wire, they make a sea anchor. This way they can avoid being blown the wrong way if the wind shifts. The other problem continues to be their thirst. Gene teaches the other two how to pray and ask God for rain but it isn't until later in the night that the weather changes. Laughing in happiness, the men collect as much rainwater as they can on their shirts in the water bag. 
After a week of being adrift, Gene finally gets tired of failing at catching anything with his hook, so he takes out his knife, ignoring Dixon's protests and worrying over the raft. After a few random stabs at the water, Gene is successful in a big way. He's managed to kill a shark, which they bring onto the raft and open to eat the little fish it recently consumed. They save the shark meat and their socks to be used as bait later. This little dinner of theirs, though, has some serious consequences because they keep throwing the shark blood into the sea to keep the raft clean. Other sharks have smelled it and are now following them around. So when one night, a sleepy Gene distractedly puts his hand in the water, it gets bitten. Luckily, he takes it out before he loses it and Dixon wraps it up with Tony's bandana, but the damage is done. Two weeks since the accident have passed, and while they haven't gotten another catch like the shark, they do get one more day of rain to refill their water back. Hope is starting to be hard to keep, and Tony begins looking at his gun with some depressing thoughts in mind. Gene takes it from him just in time when a bird lands on their raft and shoots it, causing the body to fall into the ocean. Dixon wastes no time jumping in to recover it, but the bird's blood has gotten the attention of a shark as well. The boys try to shoot it but the gun gets jammed, so Dixon has no choice but to swim as fast as he can. Luckily, he makes it back to the raft before he gets caught, and now they have bird meat to eat, which Dixon thinks tastes like chicken. Since the gun can't be used anymore, Tony throws the bullets in the ocean, sad over what a sign of defeat this could be taken as. On the morning of day 20, Dixon wakes up to discover all three of them have been sleeping, so there's been no watch. Gene thinks it's not worth the trouble. It's been two days with no wind and the islands aren't coming any closer. He calls out Dixon for his map, not understanding how he could have calculated their position anyway if their plane had been lost and they didn't even know what their starting point had been. He also thinks it's Dixon's fault that the plane got lost because somehow, he had flown them out of range. After lots of arguing and yelling, Dixon admits he had been expecting to see islands a couple of days ago. So yes, their course is off. His memory finally kicks in and he remembers what happened on the plane. He had fallen asleep. It was only a couple of minutes, but still enough for them to miss their turn. He apologizes for his mistake, knowing he will never be able to make up for it. A depressing mood falls over the raft, so trying to make things better, Gene picks up the chart and says that while it may not be perfect, it's their only hope to return home. When Tony makes a joke about producing their own win, Dixon gets an idea. Using Gene's knife, he cuts off the soles of his shoes, which they proceed to use to row. A month after the incident, they finally got some rain again. Except this isn't average rain, it's a full raging storm with lightning included. The waves grow high and aggressive, and they end up turning the raft over. The men fall in the water and lose the few tools they had, including their rowing shoes, but the raft is more important. They find each other by holding onto it and together with the help of the wind, they flip the raft back on position before climbing on it, huddling close for warmth until the storm passes. The rain is gone in the morning, but the men are too tired to do anything else other than laying down. Having lost all hope, their conversation turns depressing. They discuss what to do with the body if one of them dies since it could be food, remember the people at home that believe them to be dead, and make Dixon cry when Tony and Jen say they wouldn't have sent him to court-martial for his mistake. Tired of this somber mood and thinking they've come too far to give up now, Tony convinces his friends to roll with their hands to at least go down trying. This tires them out so much that Dixon does what he said they wouldn't, which is drinking seawater, and Tony falls asleep so deeply that for a moment they believe him to be dead. Suddenly, Gene sits up when he sees something green in the distance. They've finally found an island. Desperate enough not to care if it's taken by the enemy and with tears in their eyes, the men begin rowing with their hands until they reach the shore waves that push them the last stretch of the way onto the beach. The three of them land on the sand safely, and as soon as they see two shacks nearby, they make their way there on shaky legs. This landing occurs on February 20th, after 34 days at sea and sailing their raft for over a thousand kilometers. Dixon is given the Naval Cross for bringing his crew to safety when they are rescued, but he never flies another combat mission again. Tony is unable to pursue a career in the Navy due to his injuries, and when he dies in 1986, his ashes are spread at sea. Gene works as a radio operator during the war and marries Tony's sister in 1946. 